Hello, and welcome to the Is the Dominion Time of Use Rate Right for Me Solar Lunch and Learn webinar uh, from Solar United Neighbors and co presented by Dominion Energy. My name is Aaron Such. I'm the Mid Atlantic Regional Director for Solar United Neighbors, and we'd like to welcome you to this webinar. I am going to be joined by my colleague Roger Horowitz, who's going to be helping facilitate this webinar, as well as Derek Wanger from the Dominion Energy team. If you are not familiar with Solar United Neighbors, we're a nonprofit organization that represents a constituency of solar owners and prospective solar owners. We help people go solar, join together, and fight for energy rights. We're a national nonprofit with active programs in 12 states. Before we get started in earnest, I'm sure we are all very familiar and fluent with Zoom, but a few pertinent things. Uh, we have many RSVPs today, and this is meant to be an interactive webinar. So if you need to submit questions at any time, please do that in the chat box. Roger will be facilitating that, and then after each section, we're going to stop and pause for questions. Also, the webinar is being recorded, so we will share a link to the recording with everyone who is RSVP'd after the event. So let's go ahead and get started. The goals and format of this webinar um, are for you to get a basic understanding of the voluntary time of use off-peak plan. I'm going to be joined by Derek Wanger of Dominion Energy. He's the strategic advisor of Grid Solutions for Dominion Energy and has been instrumental in helping develop this as part of the um, stakeholder process that informed the rate. So I'm going to start with um, an overview of time of use rates, the advantages and disadvantages, and the considerations based on technology. I'll stop for questions. Then Derek is going to speak about program eligibility program basics, the enrollment process, and ongoing support and education. After that, we're going to pause for Q&A. We aim to have you um, be out of here in about an hour or so. We might go a little bit more or a little bit less, depending on questions. So again, the goal is for you all to have a good understanding if this is a good fit uh, based on your energy habits or access to technology. Also being able to understand program details, how to enroll, what are the processes, how do I unenroll, and then how do I give feedback on the rate. And as a really quick background, this uh, rate was informed by 2019 piece of legislation here in Virginia, SB 1769, that dictated a stakeholder process. So Solar United Neighbors was one of many different stakeholders that participated in that process, as well as environmental industry groups to help inform the rate. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with just a real basic overview. Um, what are time of use rates? Well, they are variable energy rates that are based on the time of day, the season, and even day of the week. And this represents a departure from what we are typically used to. We pay the same price typically for a kilowatt hour of energy used, whether we use that at 7 p.m. on a hot summer afternoon or 3 a.m. in the middle of the night. But it costs the utility more to generate and deliver power or energy during peak times. So the goal of a time of use rate is to give price signals that influence consumer behavior that more uh, align with those peak times. And we see them pretty frequently in our daily life, whether it's surge pricing from Uber or even trying to get lift tickets on a, on a weekend. Um, we see those pretty frequently. The goal of a time of, rate, time of use rate is to shift from the peak times to off peak. And in doing so, the consumer provides a value to the utility and receives a financial value in return. And in our work, we're, see that we're seeing that these rates are becoming more common across utility territories. So in this case, specific to Dominion, Dominion is what's called a winter and a summer peaking utility. And uh, we have on the right an example of a load profile. Um, and this is the variation in electric demand over time. And uh, the load profile in this case represents the aggregate amount or what Dominion is trying to supply. And as I mentioned, Dominion is a winter and a summer peaking utility. It's also worth noting that the grid isn't static. It's really dynamic. So it changes based on season, time of day, as well as the type of day. But really what we're seeing is that uh, the peaks are influenced in the winter by electric heat 
So if you follow the graph, actually zero is 12 a.m. As you get to 5 a.m., people are starting to wake up in the winter. They're firing up that winter resistance heat and it drives a peak. And then in the summer, what's driven by the peak is AC use, uh, air conditioning. As the day gets hotter, people are firing up or using more of their uh, AC and that results in a peak demand. So the time of use goal is to reduce those peaks, peaks or shift load. Basically flatten that out. It kind of looks like a two hump camel. So if the time of use rate is successful, it shaves those humps off the camel and shifts load to times when there is less peak. And that's important to all utility customers because peaks drive cost. Um, to meet peak demand, the utility is typically firing up more expensive generation or there might be grid congestion. So um, by shifting that load and flattening the peak, you're able to provide a benefit to all utility customers. And some of the advantages to the customers and utility, just to go over them in general, you can see cost savings. So by shifting your behavior or using technology to save money, you can get a financial benefit out of it. There is benefits to all utility customers. As I mentioned, as you shift load from the most costly times, you reduce the need for additional grid investments. And energy is a freeway or an interstate. Uh, typically, the, the need to build additional infrastructure is based on accommodating those peak traffic times. So if you're able to uh, reduce the peak traffic times, it can reduce the need for the investments that are paid for by all utility customers. Additionally, there are major environmental benefits. So off-peak generation is typically cleaner, lower carbon, or even zero carbon generation. And then lastly, it offers the uh, opportunity for a customer to participate and offer a locational value of resources on the distribution system. Um, so the fact that a customer, a residential customer can shift their energy use can more can help the utility match demand with supply. That can result in increasing reliability and also participation from consumers as technology or distributed technologies like solar or battery storage become more widespread. You offer the opportunity for some win-win opportunities, a value for the consumer to provide value to the grid, rate payer, as well as environmental benefits as well. So what may be some of the disadvantages? And um, just, to, just to say this rate you know, is, is a pretty good rate. Derek could speak to how it was uh, developed, but it may not be a good fit. So some of the disadvantages might be that it requires technology and or behavior changes. So you may, you're gonna need the technology to be able to shift your energy use, and you're gonna need the willingness to behave in ways that, uh, that can shift your energy usage. It may result in higher bills, and for solar, it's harder to calculate the return on investment for solar with time of use compared to fixed rates. It does require a smart meter. And again, Derek will get into that. And it may simply not be a fit for all consumer or load profiles. So you may learn more about it and say, hey, just the way that we use energy, this is not gonna be a good fit. But it could be a good fit for many. So to answer that question, what, some, what are some of the things you should be thinking of? First, do you have a smart meter? If you do not have a smart meter, you cannot participate in this rate. Also, people that are on demand response programs with Dominion cannot participate either. Also, do you have the technology to shift energy use? So what are some of the technologies? Of course, solar, battery storage, smart appliances, efficiency, uh, electric vehicle. Those are all tools that can help you. Also, are you an energy or a gadget geek? Our experience is, is that when people go solar, they become very mindful of what they're producing with their, with their solar arrays. So they become very mindful of their consumption. They start to get gadgets where they can get a, a good overview of what they're consuming. So uh, if you're watching, you know who you are. You're somebody who's very fluent or literate in energy consumption, all of the technology, and you have a really good idea of what you use and when you use it. Also, do you have the desire to offer feedback? So this is a rate in which um, the first time of use rate pilot in which concurrent use of technologies, that's solar battery storage, can be a part of this rate. Previous Dominion rates uh, for data collection purposes did not allow 
uh, solar to participate with EV or whole home plans. So this is an opportunity for solar owners to offer feedback on the rate. As I mentioned before, we think it's a good rate. It may not be perfect, but you can offer feedback. What do you like about it? What might be able to um, be changed in the future? And since this is a pilot, um, hopefully that can inform future rates. Also, are you willing to change your behavior? So that may mean, is your whole family on board? Making sure that people are familiar with the way that um, energy shifting is gonna be able, or load shifting can help you save money. Additionally, are there occupancy shifts in your home? So you may consider this uh, not to be a good fit if you rent it out on Airbnb, or maybe the in-laws come for two or three two or three weeks or a couple months during the summer, you're gonna make sure, you have to make sure that all people that are living in the dwelling are on board and are uh, aware of the rate. So we're gonna go into some of the just basic considerations for solar and some of the other technology. Um, what we've seen is in some of the analysis is that the value really depends on the way that your panels are oriented. And in many, in a lot of cases, just a straight time of use rate, if you don't employ any other technologies, can increase your return on investment horizons for solar. West-facing panels in our analysis tend to be better. Why is that? Well, this rate has afternoon peak in both the summer and the winter. And to give you an example, summer peak is between 3 and 6 p.m. and you're off a, a, a premium rate for that power. And um, because the days are longer, you're gonna have some pretty good generation during that peak time. You also have a pretty high cost differential, almost twice of what it would be off peak. So you're producing very valuable solar as a very, very powerful or very valuable energy. And it bears repeating west facing panels are gonna be producing more as the sun goes down. And then east facing panels are gonna be producing more during sunrise. You also have a winter peak, but that's probably gonna be harder to hit with solar because the sun uh, goes down at that time, but potentially on some of the say fall or spring seasons as the day length is a little bit longer. Anticipating a question, um, what is the export value um, given that the, the rate for electricity changes? And a grid export is simply energy that you're producing from solar that you're not using at the time. You can think of it as spinning your meter backwards. So a common question is, well, what value am I gonna get given that there's different uh, price differentials during the day? You're gonna get it based on when energy is produced. So if you're producing or exporting electricity to the grid in the summer, say between three to 6 p.m., you're gonna get 22 cents for that and you're gonna apply it to peak, to peak um, consumption. So you're going to get the value for what you export to the grid based on the peak time or off peak time when you produce it. There's also a $500 incentive and that is available to the first 500 people that go solar after subscribing to the rate and Derek can speak more to that. Also an additional consideration for solar is the opportunity to get a value proposition from solar plus storage. Uh, solar plus storage applications here in Virginia, you will typically have batteries that sit and wait for a grid outage. So time of use gives you the opportunity to recoup a value stream for batteries that are used for resilience, basically putting them to work while they're waiting for a grid outage. And you're doing what's called energy arbitrage. That's a fancy word for meaning charging the battery when energy is cheap and abundant, and then discharging it during peak times when it's more expensive. And this rate does offer um, three hour peak windows. So those are pretty manageable, meaning that um, you could store energy in your battery during those off peak times or when you're producing from solar and then discharge them to um, power your appliances or your loads during peak windows, reducing your dependent, uh, dependency on that expensive peak energy. Now there are some caveats. It depends on your battery technology and design. So not all batteries are um, compatible with what's called a time of use or even a self-consumption mode. And also um, frequent discharges and charging uh, cycles can reduce the life of your battery. So again, speak to your installer or speak to us and we're happy to help you with that. So considerations for electric vehicles. Uh, Probably the main thing is you're gonna definitely have cheaper fuel with this time of use rate. 
And I wanted to focus on the super off peak times, which are 12 a.m. to 5 a.m. That is the time when energy demand is typically the lowest. And in this case, um, the price for electricity is much cheaper. So if you were to just program your vehicle to, to charge during those times, you could save up to about a 24% average on fuel. And it'd be like paying 80 cents per gallon. So definitely some cost savings there, just depending on when you fuel your vehicle. And it's worth noting that most chargers or vehicles offer programmable charge time. Even my electric vehicle is a 2013 model, so it's definitely not the newest one, but I can program it to charge during certain times, as well as most level two electric vehicle chargers do have those. So it's something that, that is pretty accessible. Uh, the other benefit, of course, is environmental benefits. Uh, transport, uh, transportation is the number one source of greenhouse gas emissions in Virginia and across the country. So as the grid is getting cleaner, you have the opportunity to replace a carbon intensive fuel, petroleum, with fuel that is getting much cleaner and potentially zero carbon. And those off peak or super off peak times are mostly renewable energy or zero carbon fuels. Utilities will typically dispatch uh, renewables such as solar and wind first because the cost of fuel is essentially zero. And here in Virginia, about 30% of our uh, electrical generation is nuclear. And even a, a bigger percentage of that during those off times is nuclear. That's because it's really hard to cycle nuclear power on and off. So it runs at a constant uh, clip and even times of during demand uh, reduced demand, it's really, uh, really abundant. So what, whatever you think about nuclear, you can't argue against the fact that it is a zero carbon resource. And then lastly, um, you by choosing to power from the grid, you're actually using um, renewable or I'm sorry, um, local fuel, you know, almost all of our energy is generated um, here in Virginia. So that's an additional value proposition, uh, which is broader to electric vehicles. So other technologies and behavior changes, um, again, what we see with our folks that go solar is they start to become very uh, mindful of what they consume or what they produce with solar, then start to get other things uh, regarding their, their um, energy consumption. And just to give you a, a few examples, so getting a smart programmable thermostat with the time of use rate, you may be able to preheat or cool your home um, to take advantage of less expensive off-peak energy and then be ready for those times. So for example, in the winter peak, uh, you have a 5 to 8 p.m. window. You may choose to heat your home before that 5 p.m. peak and uh, take advantage of the less expensive energy. So those smart programmable thermostats and appliances allow you to do that. Additionally, Energy monitoring and load shifting, and, and it goes to kind of the, the energy literacy uh, sense and, and the Lumen smart panel are good examples of that. And they give you a better idea of what you're actually consuming, what you're able to, you know, what each appliance is drawing, the dollar value. So just having a sense of those things gives you um, a better picture on how to control your energy usage and what appliances might be your biggest or most costly consumers of electricity. And then um, simple behavior, just using heavy appliances off peak. So things that are discretionary like a dishwasher or a dryer. Uh, this rate does have holidays and weekends that are off peak. So you can simply choose to do those things there. And then efficiency operate, upgrades as you look to replace uh, appliances like HVAC, HVAC systems with more efficient appliances, of course, uh, that's going to offer the opportunity to save more money. If you are interested in more information, um, we have a, a pretty extensive blog that we just did. And I think Roger is going to hopefully share that into the chat function. And um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to see if there are any questions in which Roger will facilitate. So um, audience questions. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, I just shared that in the chat, everyone. So you should be able to see it on there. Um, I have some questions about smart meters. Uh, one, someone wanted to know if uh, bi-directional meters are the same as smart meters. And also, uh, there's a question, if you don't have a smart meter now, does that mean that you can't participate in the pilot? Or how can you go ahead and get a smart meter? Great question. I think I might punt those over to Derek. 
<laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, great questions. Um, so I guess for, I, I assume a lot of the audience members are, are solar owners or prospective solar owners. Um, just because you have a net metering or, or solar on your rooftop, uh, you do have to have a bi-directional meter and Dominion obviously provides you that one capable of measuring load flows from either direction. That is not, however, by default, a smart meter. So a smart meter uh, in the industry sense is one uh, that is a digital meter. It relies on real-time or near real-time communications with the utility, uh, really to avoid uh, the need for a, a physical meter reader. Uh, they either has to walk up to a uh, to the meter itself or uh, drive a van uh, past your, your, your home or business. Um, so that relies on communications infrastructure, which I think is the key point. Um, that just because it, th there's really not an option for us to install a smart meter for anyone who has an interest in the time of use rate, given it is relying on the communication infrastructure being present in that area uh, to both read the meter and provide the information back to Richmond um, for our billing system. Um, so a smart meter is, is a digital meter. Uh, they've largely been deployed uh, in the Charlottesville area uh, of our service territory. Uh, Northern Virginia, uh, so Herndon, Alexandria, and a couple other areas uh, in Northern Virginia, um, and R Richmond, Virginia, including the Petersburg area. So we have uh, a good footprint right now. Uh, we have a little over um, 700,000. I just realized the, the slides uh, that we'll cover later is, is a little bit dated, just as of 30 days ago, but just reached the 700,000 mark. So we do have a, a, a lot of meters out there and a lot of customers that will be eligible for this rate. And right now, that is a requirement to participate. So we'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a, a few minutes. Thanks, Eric. And also, uh, there's a question. How can you find out if you have a smart meter? Will that be on your bill or on your account? Uh, it'll be on your account. Um, if you go to uh, the Manage Account website or the, the billing page on dominionenergy.com, um, where you would be able to view your bill, uh, pay your bill, and find out any other information, um, you will, for any customer who is eligible in this rate, you'll see uh, on the navigation window, voluntary rate programs, and you'll see off-peak plan, which is the, uh, the name of this program. Um, so that will automatically show uh, in your list of choices and options that you have um, with respect to programs and rates that you can participate in. Um, and we've also received feedback from a number of these events to just make it even more clear as just to have a simple box and window on your account uh, to designate whether you are a smart meter customer or a non-smart meter customer. So we're, we're working on that uh, as we speak and hope to have um, that just up front and visible for everyone to see uh, in the near future. Uh, thanks. I, I have a, a couple more questions that have just come in. Um, how long will the pilot last? And if, and if someone got their solar switched on this month, are they still eligible for the $500 incentive? I could, I could. Uh, good questions. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. So the, it's a four-year program, pilot program, and you can nod, Derek, if I'm getting it right. Um, and then people for the $500 incentive, you have to go solar. Um, you have to sign up for the rate first and then interconnect the system. Is that correct? That's right. It's basically the, the commission order that we received approving the rate. Um, designated the rebate was for new solar customers who were also a participant um, in the time of use pilot. Thanks. And um, and then uh, to how do how do folks apply for that for the for the rebate um, after that happens? Derek, you're going to cover that in your next you slide. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, great. Well, we we can we can just wait on uh, we can just wait on. Um, some more of these um, until Derek's had a chance to present. Great. Well, I'm going to turn it over to you, Derek, and just wanted to say a few words as well is, uh, you know, I think this, it, it's an opportunity for some win-wins. Um, you know, as people know that, you know, Solar United Neighbors isn't always aligned with Dominion, but in this case, uh, I think there's an opportunity to provide some value, not only to solar and modern grid customers, but also to uh, the utility and all rate payers themselves. And, and I just note that, um, you know, as far as your work and interconnecting systems, you've con interconnected a lot of systems. And I think we count ourselves as allies in terms of wanting to see 
as much uh, solar or distributed solar out there for customers and uh, just appreciate your work. So I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, you can tell me when you need the next slide. Sure, thanks, Aaron. And I know we jumped into a couple of questions there, but wanted to thank you again for allowing us to participate uh, in this webinar and, and really spread the word on what we think, again, is a really good opportunity um, for a lot of win-wins, I think, for us, uh, the customers themselves and, and everyone else that we'll talk about here in a few minutes. Just real quickly um, about me and just kind of how we got here. This is to be my 13th year at Dominion. So it's been my whole career thus far um, at Dominion Energy, and I've had the privilege to work within the electric distribution organization and really learn a lot um, about the wire side of the business and the wires that uh, basically any of the activity and infrastructure from a substation to uh, the side of your home or business, really de delivering power and then restoring it um, in times of storms and outages. Uh, a lot of that time was in finance, but I've had the privilege to work, uh, I think, since fall of 2017 um, in the, on the renewable energy side, on the small scale renewable energy side. And part of that, as Aaron mentioned, uh, our group was responsible for any net metering interconnection. Um, so if you interconnected a net metering uh, facility with Dominion Energy anytime between 2017 and about uh, 2019, and early 2020, um, it, it came through our shop. And uh, again, had the privilege to really be involved uh, in that world uh, in a period of exponential growth um, and definitely count Aaron as an ally. He's, he's been um, really valuable feedback and I think uh, just perspective. Um, and we've obviously tried to, to meet him in the middle um, when there's any questions, information that we can socialize and, and make sure people are, are making the right decisions for themselves and, and getting access to, to the right information. Um, so just appreciate all of your efforts uh, over the years. Um, so just real quickly, Aaron's covered a lot of the fun stuff already, but wanted to make sure you guys have plenty of resources uh, for folks that are interested in learning about the rate, enrolling in the rate, um, or just learning more and following along uh, and maybe evaluating that decision over the next uh, uh, coming months, coming years. Um, so real quickly, just a couple of the basics about eligibility. We've covered some of this already in the Q&A, which is good. Um, a smart meter is a requirement. So again, the slide I realized was is dated now within the last couple of weeks, we've eclipsed the 700,000 mark. So we do have uh, quite a bit of smart meter deployment on our system. Uh, for perspective, we have more than 2 million residential customers in our service territory. So we still have a long ways to go. Um, and for, for customers who do not yet have a smart meter, um, we're hopeful uh, to, to continue with the full deployment um, and get smart meters to all customers who have an interest in one. Um, that'll be in front of the commission again in 2021. They've, uh, in our recent attempts to receive approval for full deployment, they have asked for more information and more context before they approve for all customers. Uh, and, and in one of those orders, one of those specific requests was a, a more comprehensive plan and understanding for time of use rates and how, if paired with smart meters, can provide benefits uh, to all customers. Uh, in our service territory. So again, we're, we're encouraged uh, with the information the commission's provided and that'll be in front of the commission for review again this year. Um, so stay tuned and, and we hope we can get uh, smart meters out uh, to all, all, the cost, all, all of our customers in Virginia as soon as is prudent. Um, this is a four-year experimental pilot. So this will run through 2024 um, and participation completely voluntary. So again, this is not a default rate um, new customers in our, in our service territory will still go on, on what we call schedule one or is it the standard customer rate where it's, it's relatively flat pricing uh, and no fluctuation or tiers with respect to time of use um, pricing. It's completely voluntary. You can join at any time. Um, you can also unenroll at any time. So if you decide that this rate simply isn't for you uh, or the behavioral changes um, just don't quite line up with your day-to-day -day routine or you're just not in a good position to make those changes to achieve the savings, that's fine. And as Aaron said, this is this is not a rate we think is perfect for everyone. Uh, it's a pilot. It's experimental. We've definitely leveraged a lot of the best uh, industry information and insights that we can, as well as stakeholder input along the way to build a rate that we think hits the most sweet spots um, for customers and puts them in a good position to take uh, to achieve savings. Um, but it, again, if it's not for you, you can unroll in any time. 
If you unenroll, there is a stay out period for at least one year. And that's really to avoid uh, customers trying to game the system, if you will. Um, so for customers, for instance, that have uh, gas heat instead of electric heat, uh, for them jumping on only in the seasonal periods where it makes sense for them or advantageous for them um, and hopping off when it's, when it's not. Um, also participants uh, cannot be enrolled in the time of use rate and also another demand response program that the, com the company is offering. And really the reason for that is we wanna make sure that we have the best picture of how effective this rate is, is, um, is in achieving those demand shifts or reductions, kind of unimpeded by other, other programs or pairings. And we hope that this is temporary. Um, this is really just a condition of a lot of pilots to make sure again, that you can study it um, with the best and cleanest information that you can. Um, we've mentioned the solar rebate, uh, again, that for, for uh, net metering customers, new net metering customers, and really the process to enroll uh, in the rebate or become eligible for the rebate, again, is to enroll in the time of use rate itself. Um, and then any NMIN forms or interconnection forms that are submitted after that date uh, where a customer is uh, already enrolled in the rate 1G or off-peak plan, um, we will know and flag that and verify it uh, with those customers that they do in fact want to apply and receive the rebate, um, of which will be a, uh, issued as a check. So not a bill credit, it'll actually be a physical check that would come from Dominion Energy and our partners um, and redeemable for those customers within 60 days of interconnection. So that is really the, the ultimate trigger uh, to issue the rebate is once the system has been uh, completed, inspected, and energized. Uh, that really starts the clock, uh, if that makes sense, for issuance of the check. And again, we'll cover a lot of information here in a minute um, with respect to uh, where to learn more uh, and just the basics of the rate. Um, but the one-stop shop is really dominionenergy.com slash TOU. Uh, that's the, the official landing page uh, of the rate and where you can go to pre-enroll uh, and learn any more information about uh, the rate itself. You go ahead to the next slide. Um, so again, just some basics about the, the peak periods uh, and, and the variable pricing of the rate. Um, during the summer periods, or May, May to December, as we define it within the rate, there is just one peak. It is 3 to 6 p.m. Um, with the better part of every day and evening um, in, off, in the off-peak periods. And then the super off-peak periods between 12 a.m. and 5 a.m. Um, that are especially advantageous to EV owners and customers who have maybe smart appliances or features, apps in their home that allow them to schedule certain activities. Um, that's a really good opportunity and, and one of the, the lessons learned and best practices that we found across the industry um, to put customers in it with a large enough window um, to really cycle appliances or achieve um, a full charge in, in, in many cases, not all cases, but most cases uh, on their EV uh, when, when pricing it is most advantageous to them. Holidays and weekends, I'll, I'll highlight, uh, there is no peak period. So that's true all year round. Um, these are mostly federal holidays as defined uh, by kind of the federal calendar um, and then all weekends. So that's a really good opportunity for this rate. And then again, in the winter, really the only difference um, is that there is a morning peak. Um, and as Aaron mentioned, uh, I think our most recent peak was a winter morning in January, three or four years ago. Um, so we want to best align this rate with our Dominion Energy's actual load shape and the, the generation and load that we're planning for every day and make sure that we can make the biz, biggest impact to not only uh, allow for participants in this rate to achieve savings, but if we're able to lower system generation costs across our fleet, uh, those savings are passed on to all customers, whether they participate in a rate like this or not. Um, so this is a great opportunity and just some context around some of the logic as to why the, these, these rate periods um, shaped out as they did. And, and one thing I'd highlight too is for customers who potentially have participated in prior pilots that we've had, because this is not our first time of use rate or offering, um, I, I would really highlight that three hour period. That's one of the things that we learned is that in, in our prior rates, the peak period was too long um, even if a customer pre-cooled or preheated their home, the peak window was so long that by the end of that peak window, or as you were approaching the end, um, it really was either uncomfortable for customers or that the home had to 
uh, really start supplementing uh, some of that pre-cooling activity and then ended up attributing to that peak. So the three hour window we think is, is, um, is a window that we, we hope customers can take advantage of uh, and make reasonable behavioral changes to achieve those savings. Next slide. So to enroll, we've talked about this uh, briefly, but again, I would, I would uh, tell everyone to go to their online billing page, wherever they view their bill today. And I know if, if you're like me, you don't frequent that site maybe that often. Obviously for net metering customers, it could be a little different um, where you, you have a, a closer eye on your day-to-day your -day activity, um, your weekly activity or your month, certainly your monthly activity just to know where you stand. Um, so online is gonna be the best resource. And again, you'll see in your navigation pane if you, page, if you're an eligible customer uh, under the voluntary rate programs, you'll see the off-peak plan uh, as an eligible program for you to participate in. Um, one thing I'd highlight too, is then uh, we hope in the next 30 days, uh, but certainly by the end of the first quarter, we'll have the bill comparison tool live. And that's really the, the screenshot or, or snapshot that you see on this slide. And what that'll do is it'll be a personalized chart where it takes uh, your historical usage, your past 12 months usage, and do effectively a what if scenario. So it'll show you what you paid and what your usage uh, has been over the last 12 months and what it would have been had you been enrolled in the off-peak plan. Uh, we think this is really important and valuable for customers who are considering uh, whether this is a good fit for them um, and certainly to provide kind of an order of magnitude idea of what behavioral changes you might need to make to put you in a position to save. Um, so it's not perfect. I know it's, it's a static analysis. So it's assuming um, you have made no behavioral changes and we certainly hope that customers who enroll uh, make those changes to achieve and, and the optimal savings and optimal result really uh, under this rate, but still a really good tool to just let you know um, if this is in your wheelhouse and, and what kind of changes you would need to make to take advantage of this. And obviously on that, uh, on that same uh, page and uh, online resources, there'll be an opportunity for you to elect certain preferences with how frequent and what types of communication you wanna have with Dominion Energy while you're on the rate, what type of information you wanna receive from us, again, to make sure that you're put in a, a good position to stay on track um, and keep yourself reminded of, of those peak periods of the pricing um, and what you need to do to take full advantage of a rate like this. Next slide. Um, and finally, ongoing engagement we know is gonna be critical to a rate like this. Um, this is another lesson learned from the past is that we wanna make sure that customers aren't inundated with information, but receiving the reminders um, and information along the way while they're a participant in the rate, again, to make sure that they're on track. So what that'll start with is just a general welcome kit, a letter um, that outlines the rate and how you should, uh, where you should go to receive more information and how you will uh, receive information once you're enrolled in the program. Um, and the ever helpful refrigerator magnet <laughs> that I tend to rely on, whether it's trash pickup, or daycare routines, um, and now time of use rates, just a, an easy reminder where you can look uh, at those peak periods um, if, you, if you tend to forget those over time. And one thing I'd mention too is that uh, given this is a pilot, it will be a study over the next four years. We have a, a measurement and verification vendor that we've been partnering with and working with on, as we have with a number of our demand side management energy efficiency programs, um, to be kind of a third party unbiased observer to analyze the data uh, and, and really determine the effectiveness of the rate that we'll report out to the State Corporation Commission and our stakeholder group um, each year and periodically along the way. Um, but this vendor will also be uh, hosting a series of surveys for participants who uh, enroll in the program, really just uh, customer satisfaction type information um, and understanding what tweaks, if any, or what feedback that, that those customers have to make the rate better, um, whether it's the, the core design of the rate, or again, what information uh, may be helpful for them to, to achieve savings and be successful while on the rate. Um, so this will be an evolving process over time, which uh, I think is a real advantage of this rate and this process is that we think we've, we've incorporated all the best information and insights in the original design and rollout of the rate, but we also have the opportunity to make changes and improvements along the way 
And luckily the commission has granted us that flexibility over the next four years so that we really get it right and learn as much as possible uh, with the hope of making this available to all customers uh, at some point down the road or at the end of this pilot. Um, so again, really appreciate the opportunity uh, to participate in the webinar. I know we'll have, looks like a good amount of time for Q and A. Um, and I, I haven't been able to follow along the chat perfectly, but I see there's a lot of, of questions and engagement and just a lot of participation in general. So we really appreciate everyone joining today um, and be happy to answer some questions. Great, thank you so much, uh, Derek, and thank you, Aaron. We have lots and lots of questions and feel free to keep putting questions in the chat. We have, uh, we have a lot that have come in. There's been, uh, and people have been answering each other's questions too, we, which is always, uh, always great to see. Okay, um, we have a, a question from Scott and he wants to know that if folks make a switch to the time of use rate and then notice that it isn't for them and they experience an extremely high bill, he wanted to know if there was a one-time cap or um, if they'd be able to get off right away. Yeah, great question. Um, so there's there's no cap, but uh, one thing that we have done is uh, ensure that a customer can unenroll at any time. So that includes after the first month bill. Um, we certainly have designed the rate and the, the information and education around the welcome kit uh, and obviously everything online to hopefully avoid that scenario. Um, and we're hopeful that customers only enroll um, once they've done a little bit of research and really examine their, their historical usage um, to assess whether they can make some of these modest behavioral changes and, and take advantage of the rate. For all that being said, um, if this isn't the rate for you, um, you can unenroll at any time. Now, again, that will trigger a, a one-year period where you can cannot re-enroll, um, but would be eligible, assuming that there's capacity still uh, within the 10,000 customer limit to re-enroll in the future. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks, Eric. Um, we have a lot of questions about batteries and, um, and about how battery investment payback uh, changes um, with time of use pricing. And there's another question, if you sell more power to the grid than you use um, because of your battery charge, uh, do you earn energy credits or are you paid for the difference? So I think I could maybe start with that, you know, and I think in, in the analysis that we did, so um, Solar United Neighbors team, so I know you, Roger, and, and you're some of the members of your team looked at some of the, the different scenarios for um, solar and maybe coupling storage. And what we found is just a simple take home is that you're, you know, if you're, if you're going to plan to pay back your battery investment with time of use, it's not going to happen. Um, the value just from the time of use and shifting or doing that arbitrage just isn't enough to pay back that investment. But what we did see is that there's a value add for essentially putting your battery to work while it's waiting for a grid outage. So um, where you would typically not get any sort of financial value for that battery that would sit and wait, with time of use, then you could um, discharge it during peaks and recoup some type of value. So it's not, a, you know, we don't have a straight line assessment that this will, you know, result in X amount of savings, but it's an opportunity to put it to work. And then I think the last one was just based on, on exports. And um, maybe Derek, you could also probably answer this a little more clearly. But the exports to the grid, uh, the energy that you produce with solar or even with battery storage, you're going to get the same value uh, for the energy that is that coincides to the, the peak time. So if you're discharging your battery or you're using it to power your appliances self-consumption mode, you are offsetting that off peak or super off peak or whatever generation at that time you use from the battery. Um, and from my understanding, let's just say you discharge your battery and you're exporting during peak times, it goes into a bucket that could be applied to energy that you would consume during peak times. So Derek, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. I think you captured it pretty well. Um, so again, as compared to today, a standard net metering customer under just our, our, our default residential rate, it's, it's one for one. Uh, compensation, if you will. So the same price you uh, you are charged when you consume energy is that it's the same value when you export onto the grid. So the same is true 
uh, under this rate, it's just variable pricing, if you will. So the same, you would look at those uh, peak tiers and assess your production uh, during those times. Um, and, and you would be compensated accordingly for any of those uh, exports. And that would be captured um, as carryover, just as it, is, as it is today for net metering customers, uh, carried forward uh, to the next month or over the course of that year and applied at the first opportunity. Um, so again, I think for, for net metering customers and, and Aaron, please feel free to jump in uh, if you disagree or, or uh, have any other context, but if you're largely offsetting the most or majority of your power today, your opportunity for savings on a time of use rate like this may be small. Um, but what I would say is that if you have a, a system that produces well, um, especially during peak times, and you're able to really curtail your usage during those times, um, you have the advantage of receiving premium compensation for those kilowatt hours produced uh, during those times. So there's still advantages to be had, I think, for uh, even if you're a, a net metering customer um, who's largely offsetting a, a significant portion of your usage on a month-to-month -month basis to still achieve savings with some of the same behavioral changes that, that the rate is really uh, looking to achieve. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think that, that's great. And also everyone, um, I'll include our email address here for the Virginia team. Um, but I'm sure there will be some questions that we don't have time to get to today, and you can definitely send those along, and we can uh, and we can get answers from uh, from Derek and Aaron um, on that. Um, we had a question from uh, Stort here about um, if you are using a is there a tariff that uses peak power uh, kilowatts instead of kilowatt hours? And, um, currently with Dominion, how does time of use tariff compare with that? I, I could take a stab at that. Uh, and I think what you're describing is a demand charge, which is based on a, on a kilowatt, which is based on power and not energy. So um, there, are demand, there are demand charge tariffs, um, typically um, not very common in residential. I know that in Dominion Territory, a 15 kilowatt system will, demand, will trigger a type of standby or demand charge and that those demand charges based on peak um, power demand intervals, usually in 30 minutes are more common in commercial. But uh, Derek, I don't know if you wanna add more. No, that's right. Uh, this is, there are demand-based uh, rates at the time of use or otherwise across the country, uh, less common for residential customers. Um, so they are out there, um, but in our stakeholder process and in and, and our our research process and developing this rate, um, the feedback that we received is that there was a preference um, to, to not have a demand charge in a rate like this uh, with the goal of simplicity, understanding that this does add some complexity, complexity um, to your usage, but uh, there was a, um, an overwhelming uh, slant towards having this rate uh, all volumetric. So that's how we've designed this rate, meaning that there is no demand component with respect to the billing determinants and how uh, your usage is built on the rate, it, it is all volumetric and kilowatt hour based um, and subject to the, the variability during the peak times that we, we shared just a bit ago. Uh, thank you, thanks so much. Um, we have a couple of folks here who use third party generation systems um, such as Arcadia, um, you know, to, to subscribe to uh, to solar power without having it on the rooftop. And they wanna know if these time of use rates are applicable if you're using a third party uh, supplier. Uh, there's, there's no restriction on the Dominion Energy side that would impact enrollment. Um, I can't speak to whether it's Arcadia or the other third parties, whether they have um, certain conditions with participation um, in programs or, or subscription uh, type of offerings that they have as whether this would conflict with those. So I, I do want to be uh, upfront transparent about that. Um, but yes, on the Dominion Energy side, as a Dominion Energy customer, uh, there's no restriction um, with respect to participation in any of those third-party programs. Thanks. Um, and then we have a question from Francis, who um, is part of the uh, Rappahannock Electric uh, Cooperative and says that they uh, purchased their power from Dominion. She wanna know if this would apply to their customers as well. I can get that, that's no. <laughs> uh, 
This is for Dominion customers and um, not co-op territories, but maybe in the future there might be opportunities to participate uh, as co-ops potentially look to roll those out. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then if you can just uh, clarify again, I know you talked about this before, Derek, but um, a bunch of questions from folks about how to get a smart meter if they don't have one. Um, there's also a question about uh, when customers west of the Blue Ridge are going to be uh, getting more smart meters in their area. Yeah, so this is one uh, that, again, we don't have complete control over at the moment. Um, we, we are applying to the State Corporation Commission to receive approval for full deployment across our service territory. Um, the 700,000 meters have been uh, deployed as a series of pilots over time since so we've uh, get, gained experience from the various technologies and vendors that offer smart meters uh, that are out there. Um, so that's how we've gotten where we are with respect to the current deployment. Um, but right now there is no way to, to simply request a smart meter um, and have us come out and install it. Uh, it's really reliant on, on that long-term plan, again, that we'll be filing with the commission again this year and hope to receive approval on uh, in the near future that would allow us to begin rolling this out, uh, rolling these meters out to everyone in our service territory. Um, and again, the plan that we've put in front of them is still a relatively quick deployment. Um, if you think about the magnitude of activity that, that's required for um, for getting uh, millions of these meters deployed in a, in a safe and effective manner um, that would hopefully put us in a position to have most, if not all of our customers eligible uh, by the end of this pilot period. Um, so right now that's, that's the update that we have. And obviously we'll continue to work with Aaron and provide updates as we receive more information and guidance from the commission um, as to how that deployment and, and timeline has changed over time. And it's, sorry, the last part of that question, I think as far as the um, the western side of the Blue Ridge, I, I don't have a definitive timetable. Again, we'll um, we'll put that plan in front of the commission and um, ho hopefully be in a position to strategize and, and make those uh, plans a little bit more firm uh, once we have more information and hopefully an approval. Great. Thank you. Um, there's a question here about um, where the actual cents are um, and where people can actually see each of the rates for the summer and winter. I, I assume that's all on the Dominion time of use web website. Is that right, Derek? It is, and that'll be updated on a, on a, a frequent basis, just given whether it's fuel rates or certain components of our rates do change slightly over time. So we'll keep that um, information current, but Aaron, I think is um, included a snapshot in these slides as well. If folks wanna have a, a sense of where the pricing stands um, kind of uh, where we are today. Great. Yeah, this, this is a graphic that we just use as an example. So it's not a Dominion graphic, but it, it represents the price differentials. That's also in the blog as well. So uh, feel free to use that as a, as a reference point, as well as the tools on the Dominion website. Thanks. Now just uh, the, the only thing I would add, sorry, um, it's just, Kind of an, an easy takeaway is that we've designed this rate again from, from best practices across the industry that the peak period is about a two to one ratio if you compare it to the off peak period. Um, that's really important. You want it to be uh, enough of an incentive to really shift and influence behavior away from the peak times, um, but not punitive at the same time. So if you, if you think about, I know a lot of us that don't work for Dominion Energy are as close to this, uh, the cents per kilowatt hour can be somewhat foreign, but um, that's an easy takeaway is that the peak pricing is about two to one as compared to uh, the off peak pricing. Um, and other perspective is our current rates, I, I think hover around about 12 cents a kilowatt hour um, under kind of the current standard pricing or default rate. Um, so you can also use that as a comparison uh, to this chart as well. Thank you. Um, and Aaron, if you could just talk a little bit about smart batteries, we've gotten a lot of questions about that. Um, so just the, the overview of, of, of how that how that works, and, um, not in terms of pricing, but just um, the, the advantages of that you can of using a battery um, to manage peak demand. 
Yeah, I, I think what you're referring to is batteries that are programmable based on, on modes. So I know, you know, some of the newer lithium ion, for example, the Tesla Powerwall is on in, and a lot of the newer products have different modes. So you can program them to time of use, basically, that would discharge during the, the peak times and then charge during um, off-peak times. Same thing with, uh, well, for the most part, the, you know, the newer batteries do have them. Some of the older ones, uh, the lithium ion or the um, lead acid batteries are not as compatible. So that just might be something you wanna look at when you're looking at a battery um, brand. You know, is, it, is it compatible with the time of use rate um, or self-consumption? Basically self-consumption means that it maximizes battery energy to power loads on site. And you could certainly just reach out to your installer. That's a really easy question for them. It's also a question that we're able to help with as well. So as Roger mentioned that you could reach out to the solar team in Virginia and we're happy to, to give you some resources and, and orient you. We're, we're technology neutral, installer neutral. So hopefully put you up there um, or get you uh, uh, acquainted with the best technology. But the take home message is a lot of the newer lithium ion battery offerings do have those different rates or those different modes of operation. Thanks. Um, and uh, Robert had a question. Um, he, the, um, he's confirming that Derek, you said that Dominion will be releasing a comparison tool of 12 months of actual usage compared to the time of use rates in the near future, is that right? That's correct. Yeah, we've been working on that really since we got the, the word on approval from the commission. And um, right now we expect that hopefully to be within the next month, but certainly within before the end of the first quarter. Um, so definitely between that February and March timeline, you'll be able to go online and whether you uh, have enrolled or not, um, see a personalized bill comparison that's specific to your account and your historical usage to the extent you've been at your at your home for a 12 month period, you would see that information, see how many kilowatt hours you used, see how much you were billed under your current rate. And then again, somewhat of a what if scenario, what if you would have uh, been enrolled in, in the off peak plan and under variable pricing, um, just kind of a gauge on, on what you would have paid uh, on the rate. So again, it's a static analysis that's assuming no behavioral changes, but still hopefully gives customers a good idea um, or order of magnitude of the level of changes they would need to make to achieve savings. Thanks. Um, and then we have, uh, we have a couple of solar installers who've joined us today um, who are interested in learning more about this. And they wanted to know if there will be a good way for them to gauge uh, customer savings uh, vers versus what they're currently doing with, with, uh, with the standard pricing right now. I don't know if that, that might be a me or you question. Well, I mean, I think it's gonna take some analysis. I mean, one of the disadvantages is it's a little bit harder to um, gauge that the, the time of use payback under the variable rates. I, I think we use Aurora in-house and I think there's a couple different software tools, but um, we have, uh, again, on the blog post, have some simple kind of take home messages. And, you know, I think again, kind of more West facing panels tend to, tend to work out ahead just because of those peak windows and the cost differentials that Derek mentioned before. But, um, you know, happy to, to share as much as information that we have. But it, it again, and there's some, and this also assumes no behavior changes too. So it's important to note that somebody may get into solar net metering and then start to employ other behavior changes or other technologies and energy load monitoring um, in concert with this technology. And that was actually one of the things that we advocated for uh, as part of the stakeholder process was ensuring that solar could be used along with other technologies. So it wasn't an either or. Yeah, that's right. And just to, to add to that, um, for any of the solar developers that are out there, um, when you're talking with customers, you do have smart meters. Um, whether they're a time of use customer or not, if they have a smart meter, they have access to their interval data um, and, and their historical usage. So I would, um, I would definitely suggest uh, to the customer uh, or the installer kind of citing that uh, to any prospective customers to have them pull that data um, and potentially provide it to a developer that could maybe model it um, as compared to the, to the installation uh, or the solar array that um, someone is, is analyzing to see maybe how it matches up. 
so I would definitely highlight that is that any AMI customer does have ready access to their interval data um, and historical usage. So you could obviously com compare that, uh, you know, with this rate structure um, and the perspective production from the, uh, the facility. Great. Um, and I know uh, we are running out of time. Um, one question from Joy was, what are Dominion's objectives uh, for this? And um, is this information publicly available for, for rolling out the time to use uh, study and, and the pilot program? Yeah, so our, our objectives, I think, are really to take full advantage of, of this pilot and learn as much as possible. Again, I think we've, we've designed a rate that we think um, well, it, it's kind of it, it, the best fit that we know of to put customers in a good position to save uh, to save money and save energy. And I think that the biggest objective that we have is again, if we can better align our, our system usage with renewable resources, one, it's it's a valuable tool in our path to being a net zero utility. Um, as we get more and more renewables on the system, either customer owned or utility scale solar uh, and renewables, we have a vested interest to, to try to align our load um, as close to that as possible to one, use the lowest cost generation resource, the cleanest generation resource that we possibly can. Um, and again, if we do that right, not only are we um, doing the right thing um, with, with sustainability and the environment in mind, um, but we're lowering costs for everyone. Um, so again, this is, I think, a valuable pilot and experiment for us. Uh, experiment sometimes has a negative connotation, but I, I think it's a positive in this sense is we want, we wanted a voluntary rate uh, with a limited number of participants so that we could really study it, um, see, what, see what's working, see what's not working, whether it's rate design, customer education, access to information, all of it, um, to hopefully be in a position to roll this out and make it available to all customers if they choose. Again, I can't underscore enough that this is voluntary. Um, we want customers who are in a good position to take advantage of the rate to participate um, with the recognition that if it, it, it may not be for everyone. Um, so I think those are our objectives and um, it, all of this information is publicly available. There's an open proceeding with the State Corporation Commission. Schedule 1G was the, the tariff name. Um, Off-peak plan is, is kind of the customer marketing name of the program. Um, and this, this will continue throughout the pilot period. So there will be an annual report filed with the commission um, and available also to the General Assembly and the legislature that, that really directed this process um, that will kind of report out on the success of the rate, how many participants have been enrolled on the rate and what feedback, positive or negative, that we've received thus far um, to see if we need to make changes. So yes, definitely stay tuned, stay involved. Um, and if you need access to information, um, definitely don't hesitate to reach out to, to either me uh, or Aaron, and, and we'll make sure uh, that we get get you that right information. Any other questions, Roger? Um, no, I, th I think I think that's good. Um, I, I've encouraged folks in the chat, please feel free to email us at vateam at solarunitedneighbors.org. And I just put that in the chat as well. If you have any specific questions that we didn't get to today, so we can answer them. But no, thank you so much. Yeah, well, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us on your lunch hour. I'd like to thank Derek and your team who've been helpful in sharing these resources and you, Roger. And again, um, if you have any questions, reach out to us or contact um, Derek at, the, um, at Dominion. And hopefully we get a lot of some participation. And again, um, if there is things that need to be improved, we see the value in having solar owners offer that constructive feedback so that uh, they can participate, take some ownership, but also uh, hopefully steer time of use rates as they become more common in a more favorable way. So again, I really appreciate uh, you all joining us and we're gonna conclude this webinar, which we will send out uh, as a recorded version to all that RSVP'd. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day.